This is the Volkswagen T-Cross. And if you're in the market for a small SUV that's not so small inside and actually has a decently sized boot, hang around because the space inside there is actually pretty surprising. Now this is Volkswagen's smallest SUV and it's based on the VW Polo. And that means it's a rival for things like the Mazda CX-3 and the Toyota CHR. Now in this in-depth review, we're gonna have a look around the outside, check out some of the cool exterior design touches, then jump inside to explore that cleverly designed cabin, and then go for a drive to see how it compares on the road. If you're in the market for a small SUV or you like watching in-depth car reviews, why not scroll up and subscribe to our channel? We're gonna have a new video every Tuesday and Thursday. Styling and funky exterior design touches are really, really important in this small city SUV segment. So let's start with how the T-Cross looks. You can buy this car in three different variants here in Australia. The range starts at $28,000 for the entry level car, but the one we have today is the mid-spec City Life, which retails for $30,390 before on roads, and that adds a few little exterior niceties. Now this is V-Dub's smallest SUV. It's smaller than a T-Roc, certainly smaller than a Skoda Karoq. You can watch our in-depth review of the Skoda Karoq by clicking that pop-out banner up there. It's a little bit bigger, costs roughly the same money as this one. But even though this car is smaller than those two, I think V-Dub's designers have done a very convincing job with the design. I think the proportions are actually bang on. The whole car looks quite handsome, quite four square. It certainly even looks a little bit like a Volvo XC40, to my eye at least. And it doesn't just look like a V-Dub Polo that's been jacked up a little bit, so full marks there. Now, the grille is quite big and prominent here at the front of the car. I do like this sort of detailing in the plastic, this design here, which is replicated in this lower section down here as well. We've also got some hidden front parking sensors down here, which I like. The headlights are automatic. However, they are halogen in this mid-spec and the entry-level car. And we also get some fog lights repeated down here as well. The T-Cross does come with two exterior design packages, one called black, one called bamboo. We have black today and you can tell because on the power folding mirrors, these are heated as well, we have black caps here and we also have some black finishing on the alloys. Entry level cars get 16 inch alloys, but we have an inch larger here on this mid-spec car. So these measure 17 inches. I'm really liking the design as well, this sort of mixture of silver highlights with black painted sections. I think it looks really, really cool. I also really like this big character line which runs the full length of the side of the car. It's like a scalloped out section. I think it adds a bit of design flair which I really, really like. You also get black body cladding for the full length of the car. And if you want to go full lifestyle, there's an accessory for side steps. I wouldn't pick them, but if you want to, go nuts. Roof racks are also standard, and again, you can accessorize these with a bunch of things. So you can put bike racks up there, or even a luggage box to increase your load lugging ability. Rear seat passengers also get privacy glass, which is handy. Where it gets really clever though, is inside the boot. No electric tailgate, unfortunately, but when you open it up, you discover 385 litres of boot space. So even though this car is based on a VW Polo, you're getting a boot that's larger than a VW Golf. That's fairly impressive. Also, this second row actually slides, and if you push it all the way forward, you increase your luggage capacity to 455 litres, and that's bigger than pretty much any small SUV. It's cleverly designed as well. We've got a couple of tie down points in here and also a light. And this boot floor, when you open it, you discover a 16 inch full size spare tire. So that is a boon. So all things said, it's actually a pretty clever use of space and the sense of room continues inside the cabin. Up front, the first impression is it's certainly not as colorful and as funky in here as it is on the outside of the T-Cross. We've got lots of grey in this particular car. There is this kind of sticker across the central stack, which does liven things up a little bit, but it does feel a little bit subdued in here, especially in this orange, energy orange exterior paint. We are getting a decent amount of technology, however. This car does have the $1,900 sound and vision pack. That gets us a virtual cockpit, so 
fully digital instrument cluster behind the steering wheel. It's the same one as the Tiguan Skoda Karok. So if you want to go into more depth, watch our other video reviews on that system up here by clicking that pop-out banner up there. But it's a great system. It allows you to cycle through navigation, full width, all of the key information that you want. The graphics are great. It's a good system. It pairs with this central touchscreen, which is pretty responsive. Again, the all of the menus are logically laid out and it also has something called hand gesture. There we go. So you can swipe across the, uh, the menus there. So that means you don't have to get fingerprints all over your black central touchscreen. Speaking of black, there is quite a large amount of piano black plastic around the center stack and this central screen. I don't really like piano black myself. In terms of equipment, we're getting quite a lot for our money in this mid-spec T-Cross. There's a reversing camera to go with the front and rear parking sensors. There's also AEB with pedestrian and cyclist detection and lane keep assist, which is a handy feature. This mid-spec version also adds blind spot detection and dual zone climate control. There's also a wireless charging pad for your phone ahead of the gear shifter here. And speaking of phone connectivity, We've got two USB-C ports uh, ahead of the gear shifter. There's another two of those in the back here as well. There's a 12 volt socket. And of course, Apple CarPlay and Android Auto are wireless. I'll give you a quick look of how those systems work. So you just fire it up and the screen itself, very good resolution, nice response to touch. And you get all of the functionality that you would expect from Apple CarPlay. Now, places to put things. This is a small SUV, of course, but there is a decent amount of storage going on in here. We have a central cubby in here, which isn't the world's largest, but it's a good place to put things like wallets, keys, other loose ends. Speaking of keys, we get keyless entry and start in this mid-spec city life. And there's a handy little cubby to slot your key into down there so it doesn't slide around and rattle. Two central cup holders, which are they're on the snug side, so my oversized drink bottle fits, but only goes in about that much, doesn't go all the way in. You can fit coffee cups in there, of course, but I think a large coffee cup, that might be a snug fit as well. In terms of other cubbies, we've got that space for the wireless charging ahead of the gear shifter. There's another one up here on the center of the dash, which has a rubber lining, which is handy, but I think if you put much in there, it's just gonna slide around, possibly fall out on the move. One thing that is genuinely useful, however, is that there's another little storage compartment underneath the driver's seat. So if you wanna hide things away from prying eyes while the car is parked on the street, tuck them in there underneath the driver's seat. Now door bins, they are fairly enormous. Easily swallow my oversized drink bottle and a couple of coffee cups. Although they aren't lined with felt, unlike a Golf. So things will slide around and scratch around in there. And also when you look at the door bins, it reminds you that some of the materials in here do err on the cheap and shiny side. If you're coming into this car from something like a Golf where most of the materials, especially up top, are soft touch, you might be in for a bit of a rude shock because even on the dash, the plastics are fairly hard and shiny. Still, in terms of space, I think we're getting more shoulder space here, more shoulder room than you would in something like a Mazda CX-3. And the back seat is also very roomy, which isn't always the case in this segment. So let's jump back there and check it out. Let's start with what you don't get in the back because there are a few amenities that we are missing out on back here. There are no rear air vents. That's not always a guarantee in this class. There are a few small SUVs that do have rear air vents back here. So if rear ventilation for kiddies is a high priority for you, that's something to be mindful of. You also don't get central armrest at all or any cup holders in the center back here. That's a bit of a bummer. But general space is very impressive for a small SUV. The seat itself is very, very comfortable. The outboard seats have these nice lateral supports, which mean the seating position is very natural. I've got lots of under thigh support, a decent amount of knee room as well. That's my driving position. I'm six foot three. So tall people can fit back here. No dramas at all. I've got lots and lots of tow room as well. And the general sense of space is helped by this low window line, which is really fantastic. Something like a Toyota CHR feels very hemmed in, very dark in the back of those cars because of their raked window line. But you don't have that problem in here. Got a couple of map pockets, 
couple of reading lights up here as well. And as I mentioned earlier, two USB-C ports down here on the center console. And this sliding second row does give you some added flexibility as well. Now, if you want to put kids back here, there are ISOFIX fixtures for each of the outboard seats and we get top tether mounts as well. There's also a decent amount of storage in the door bins. So we don't have anything else except for these map pockets to store things, but my oversized Corona bottle, which just dripped on me, does fit very easily in the door pocket there, no dramas. One thing to be mindful of, worth pointing out, is that unlike the front seats where the door armrest has a soft touch material to put your elbow on, here in the back, the hard plastic from the door card continues all the way down to the armrest as well, which is a little bit of a bummer. But in terms of general space and comfort and flexibility of this sliding second row, this is one of the better second rows in the small SUV segment. Underneath, the T-Cross rides on Volkswagen's MQB platform. So like everything else that rides on that platform, the basic bones are there to ensure a very decent driving experience. In Australia, you only have the choice of one engine. It's a one liter, three cylinder turbo petrol with 85 kilowatts and 200 Newton meters. Now those outputs mightn't sound like much on paper, but they're actually very competitive for this segment. The torque figure in particular, 200 Newton meters, is one of the strongest of any small SUV. And this is actually one of the lightest SUVs you can buy as well in this segment. So in-gear acceleration and pep and go from the engine is fairly decent. Being a little one liter unit, it's actually fairly economical as well. On the official combined cycle, Volkswagen says it drinks 5.7 liters per 100 Ks. And we're actually getting fairly close to that today driving around the city. Plus being three cylinders, <laughs> you kind of get that thrummy offbeat soundtrack, which I really, really like. Some people mightn't gel with that soundtrack. It can sound a little offbeat, a little bit coarse sometimes at low revs. But I really love a three-cylinder soundtrack. It kind of sounds thrummy and offbeat. Gives the car, again, another injection of character to go with that flamboyant exterior design. The gearbox is a seven-speed dual clutch, or DSG in Volkswagen speak. And on the move like we are now, it's very good, actually. All of the shifts are smooth, unobtrusive. It kind of fades into the background. The only time you really notice the gearbox is when you pull into a street to do a three-point turn like I'm going to try and do now. Like most DSGs, sometimes they can be a little bit jerky and a little bit laggy. So I'll do a three-point turn now. Let's go into reverse. I'm on the throttle. There we go. It takes a little bit for it to engage the ratio and get going. So it's not ideal. It's not bad by any means, but it is something to be aware of when you're buying this car compared with others in this segment which have conventional torque converter automatic gearboxes. One other thing to be mindful of is that sometimes the stop-start system can be a little bit laggy, a little bit sleepy to wake up. That can become a little bit annoying if you've pulled up to an intersection or a roundabout or something like that. You've got your foot on the brake, the engine's cut out, and then you've got a gap in traffic that you want to get into. Sometimes the car can waste a few precious seconds firing the engine back up. It's not you know, dreadful by any means, and it's easily fixed by simply just turning the system off by pushing this button on the center stack, but it is something to be mindful of. As for the rest of the ride and handling package, it's all pretty much bang on. The steering is very, very light, so there's not much feel going on here, so keen drivers might think it's actually a little bit too light, but this is a city SUV, and it's very, very easy to maneuver this car, especially in low speed situations, in car parks, things like that. And that's helped by a very impressive turning circle. So you're gonna have no dramas with this car in tight underground car parks or you know, navigating narrow streets right in the thick of things. And that's where this car's gonna be spending most of its life. So that is nicely judged. Ride and handling. Look, it's not as sharp as something like a Ford Puma. That's a car you can actually go out and throw it a few corners on a twisty road and you can tell it's been set up by people that care about driving. This car doesn't quite have the same level of involvement or tenacity to its chassis. But again, for where this car is going to be mostly used, which is in the city, it does strike a nice balance between 
ride comfort and body control. It doesn't feel too wallowy, doesn't feel too soft, but at the same time, bumps like that one don't jar in the cabin either, so it's nicely judged. Take this car out of the city, get it onto the freeway or a winding country road. At 100 k's an hour, there is a little bit of wind noise, a little bit of tyre noise to contend with, but it's certainly not as bad as light SUVs used to be. Sometimes they can feel a bit of a tin can where everything sort of echoes and reverberates, but general refinement is actually fairly decent. It's taken years for Volkswagen to enter this small SUV segment in Australia, but the good news is that its first attempt with the T-Cross is a strong one. It had to be as well, because this segment is really, really crowded, really, really cutthroat. However, this car's unique styling on the outside, flexible interior with that sliding second row, and a boot that's bigger than most cars in this class really do help it stand out. So if you're shopping for a small SUV, this one definitely deserves to be on your shortlist.